on over for us and get started with tonight's um, Critical Minds, Evolution of the Human Mind and Brain. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Emily. Can you all hear me fine? Great. Then let's start with what do we want to know? Well, um, you know, we are a relatively weak ape. I would not recommend arm wrestling with a chimpanzee or a gorilla, but we have, as a species, managed to dominate the whole planet for good and for ill. So what is our secret sauce? What's the secret of our success in a, in a way? Why have we um, dominated the planet, whether that's for good or for ill, in ways that other animals have not? And we think that there's something special about the human brain. Is it something that's like a special cell type or a special circuit? And that leads into a question that is at the heart of a lot of political debates, and that is what is human nature really? So let me start with some brain basics. Um, this will take about five minutes of quick review, but I'd like to ask you some questions first. How much do you think your brain weighs? And how, you know, how much space does it fill? But let's start, how much weight do you think it has? And how many cells do you think are in it? So take a second, write down an answer or think about an answer. Well, if you're an adult, your brain weighs about three pounds and fills a space of about uh, 80 cubic inches. Now there's roughly 200 billion cells in your brain but only about a third of them are neurons, the cells that we think of as the main actors in the brain. And the rest of them are, you can think of as like the stagehands, that they're important and they keep the show on the road, but they're not the stars. Now, oddly enough, we think of our brain as mostly this area, and we kind of forget about this little area tucked in here called the cerebellum, but actually most of your neurons are in the cerebellum. They're very small, uh, but you can live without a cerebellum. And some people have walked into a clinic and it's been discovered that they have no cerebellum. So it's quite possible to live a relatively normal life without one. So you're mostly living your life using perhaps about 20 billion neurons in the majority of your brain. So what do these neurons look like? Well, here's a picture on the left of about 20 different neurons that are actually a, a small percentage of all the neurons in the area that's being pictured, but only about 20 of them have been colored so that you can see their shapes. The rest of them are transparent. So they are small cells. They're about 12, 15 microns across, sometimes a little bigger. And they, uh, so that's 12 or 15 millionths of a meter, very small but they have these long branching processes, thousands of these branches. They're called dendrites. That's related to the Greek word for tree. And these dendrites receive inputs from other neurons. So all of these branches are about communicating with other neurons. And where these dendrites touch the other neurites coming from other cells, they have a synapse and that synapse works by sending chemicals we call neurotransmitters, but some chemicals in one one thousandth of a second, these chemicals can travel the slow, or the, the, the very short distance between one synapse and another. It's much exaggerated in this picture. Um, so it's almost as fast as the electrical impulses that are coming along the neurons themselves. So these things happen very quickly. Now let's talk a little bit about human evolution and in particular about how human evolution has affected the brain. So just again, a quick review. Um, we are a member of the ape family. The ape family we think is about 30 million years old uh, and humans split from our common ancestors with our closest cousins, the chimps and bonobos, we think something like seven million years ago. These dates are all approximate. Um, so give or take a million years. 
Now, oddly enough, uh, there have been over a dozen distinct human species in the last two million years. We're the only ones left. So what if we compare our brains to a chimpanzee's brain? Well, so on the left is a, a diagram or picture of a chimpanzee brain. On the right is a diagram of a human brain. Well, it's pretty obvious the human brain is bigger. It's actually about three times as big in volume uh, and weight, um, a little more than that. And, uh, but if you look at the shapes, they're pretty much the same. You can find all the same you know, lobes and fissures on the chimp brain as you can on the human brain. Well, okay, so it looks the same. Is it organized the same way? Well, it seems that just about any distinct area that you can find on the human cortex, you can also find corresponding area. And what do we mean by that? It means that it has the same kinds of cells the same kind of layering in which the cells are arranged and the same kinds of connections to the other parts of the brain, same kinds of inputs, same kinds of outputs. And so we can find for any, just about any area of human cortex, we can find a corresponding structure on a monkey brain and certainly on a chimpanzee brain. And so that makes us think maybe we're not, maybe our brains aren't quite so special. Well, let's return to the question of size. Maybe it's just that they're bigger. Maybe we're, we're smarter just because we have bigger brains. And that's been a common idea. So let's first discuss the relationship of brain size to body size. So this is a beautiful picture that I've cribbed from a Scientific American article. And, um, I would highly recommend this article. <laughs> it's a good, a good summary of brain size and body size. But you see all of these pictures of individual mammals here from mice and bats, sorry, that's mice and that's bulls, bats to blue whales and sperm whales here. So along the whole of the mammalian order, Brains get bigger as bodies get bigger in an almost predictable fashion. We are a bit of an outlier. Chimps are also an outlier, although less so. Dolphins are quite an outlier. But actually elephants are right on the line. And blue whales and sorry, blue whales and sperm whales are actually a bit below the line. And so we can see that overall there's this relationship between brain size and body size. So let's start with comparing ourselves to a chimp. So we have roughly um, twice the body weight of a, a chimp. So if we scaled up um, a chimp's brain to human body size, because it's a, a non-linear scaling, it would be about half of our brain size. And actually that's about the size of the brain of a gorilla. A gorilla has about the same body size and body weight as a human being, but a brain about half as big. So our brains are about twice as big uh, as an ape our size should have. So we're, we are definitely an outlier. And when do you suppose that happened? Do you suppose that happened you know, near the beginning of the divergence from chimps and bonobos, or maybe more recently? Well, in fact, we have enough skulls now that we can actually find out pretty much exactly when it did happen. So for the last you know, 10 million years, up until the, about a million and a half years ago, our ancestors' brains were about the right size for their bodies compared to any other ape. They had brains that were no, nowhere different from an, uh, essentially a gorilla would have of the same size. But about a million and a half years ago, there was a sudden inflection point and we, our brain size took off dramatically. And here's a sort of more detailed picture of uh, the last million and a half years. And you can see that um, 
this, this huge inflection, this more than doubling in size, has occurred primarily in the last million years. So we want to ask why. What's different about human biology in the last million or million and a half years? Well, there's two important differences. Um, and we'll get to those in just a minute. But I want to start with the hypothesis that was pretty common 50 years ago. In fact, it was so common that we, or not me, but uh, professors used to teach this as this was a scientific fact, that we got bigger brains, or our ancestors got bigger brains, so that they could use stone tools uh, and make and use stone tools. But there's a bit of a problem with that hypothesis, and that is that, in fact, if you look at the brain areas that are actually used in the fine motor control for making stone tools, um, those are the motor and sensory areas in our brains, and they are the same size in humans as in chimps. Now remember, the rest of our brain has doubled, so proportionally, that area has actually shrunk in humans. So that doesn't seem to fit this idea of, you know, getting bigger brains in order to use stone tools. And that hypothesis is not very commonly held today. There are still some people who, who, who believe so. The most common hypothesis or idea today is that we are a social species and social doesn't mean just niceness, it also means people have moods and sometimes you have enemies or you often have enemies and you wanna keep track of them. And the more friends and enemies and the more variable their moods and how their lives change with having children or having you know, fights with other, with other apes, you have a lot more to keep track of. And it turns out that even monkeys keep track of all of the relationships between, within their group, not just their relationships with other monkeys. They keep track of you know, all the relationships between other monkeys that they are friends or enemies with. They want to know what's happening. And so you can imagine that that place is quite a strain on the brain. And here's a, a picture that um, sort of famously made this point, Robin Dunbar's uh, article in Science uh, a little over 20 years ago, sorry, little, not 20 years ago, 10 years ago, um, where he um, showed that at least among monkeys and apes, there seem to be pretty close correlations between the sort of typical group size that these uh, primates live in and what he called their cortical rate, neocortical ratio, which is basically how much of their brain is given over to neocortex. So that's the, the leading idea now. It's not the only idea. There are some other ideas, but I think this is the idea that is the most support among scientists at present. And I'd like to give you a little more evidence of a different sort. Uh, and that is if you look proportionally at which areas of the human brain seem to have expanded, let's say a little bit out of proportion to um, a uh, chimpanzee, then um, you see that one of the areas, not the only area, but one of the areas that has particularly expanded is these uh, ventral, ventral means toward the stomach or toward the bottom, and medial, which means toward the middle, these regions of our prefrontal cortex um, and those areas seem to have expanded perhaps even more in human beings um, than, than the rest of the brain. And these regions are particularly active in social relationships, particularly strong attachments. Uh, so if you are thinking of someone you love, um, then that area will be active. If you are thinking perhaps even about some bad thing that's happened to someone you love, that area will be particularly active. If you are feeling guilt about something, if you felt let somebody down, especially someone you care about, that area will be active. So uh, I think, and I'll show you some more evidence to suggest that you know, maybe a lot of the evolutionary changes have been driven by our more complicated sociability. So I'm gonna pause here for just um, a few minutes. And if there are any questions, Emily, if you'd like to uh, read them out, and then um, we'll go further. I can, I can do that. This is Kristen. 
I do have a question from Marie. She asks, how do bonobos fit into all of this? Bonobos, yes. So they are what you might call a sister species of a chimp. So let me just get back. Here we are. So um, bonobos are um, very much like chimpanzees. Think of a chimpanzee with a better haircut. Um, and uh, they live only south of the uh, Congo River. And they seem to be generally a nicer ape, uh, but not entirely. They're still, they still have violence. Um, uh, but they diverged from chimpanzees about uh, a million years ago. So we diverged from their common ancestor about six million years before that. Okay, next question. Oops, sorry. We have another, uh, I, I don't have any other questions. Do people have any other questions they wanna ask at this time? Feel free to put it in the Q&A. Um, oh, here's some more. Uh, Philip asks, any idea what drove the increase 1.5 million years ago? Sorry, any idea what? What drove the increase 1.5 yes. million years ago? So um, we'll be talking about that in a, in a bit, but, broad, but roughly speaking, it's the emergence of a complex cooperative society. So by and large, chimpanzees have politics, but their politics is who gets to boss around who. They don't cooperate very much in the wild. They do a little bit. And they certainly don't have specialized roles. But one of the key changes in human society that happened sometime between 2 million and 1 million years ago is the emergence of specialized roles and specialized skills. And uh, <clears throat> people being cooperative and helping each other do tasks, uh, particularly hunting, but also gathering. And we think that part of, well, I, I, can, I can answer more of that later. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question from Ruth Ann. She says, I have heard perhaps erroneously that the human brain is limited in size by the birth canal, i.e. humans' brains cannot be larger than the birth canal, even though the human brain continues to develop somewhat after birth. Could you hold on for 10 or 15 minutes and we'll get right to that? <laughs> so we'll, he'll get to that point. Um, so I'll move on to David's question. For a long while, the disproportionate size of PFC in humans seemed controversial. A quick Google search finds some PMAs <coughs> articles suggest that the original claim of a relatively larger PFC has good evidence. Now, is that true? So there has been a lot of controversy. There remains um, some controversy. So in terms of, I, I gave you that logarithmic plot and I tell, told, if you read the fine print, you, you read that there was a sort of uh, an exponential increase or sorry, a power law increase in the brain size relative to body size. So it wasn't linear. So within a brain, there's also these kind of nonlinear scaling relationships. And generally speaking with primate brains, the bigger the primate brain, the, the bigger the proportion of cortex, uh, sorry, prefrontal cortex is. Um, and so Susana uh, Herculano Huzel is a Brazilian neuroscientist uh, who's done the most extensive comparisons of uh, brains from different mammals, uh, argues that the proportion of neocortex in our brain is not outrageous given the, the size of our brain. And I, and I, by and large, buy that argument, but the size of our brain is, is an outlier. And uh, I would argue that the, some of the um, specific regions that have expanded sort of disproportionately um, are, not, are not predictable from the kind of uh, size relationships that she's investigating. Um, so John asks, is serotonin molecularly the same between close species? Yes. <laughs> serotonin is the same molecule down to 
aplysia, fruit flies, and, and uh, <laughs> across the animal kingdom. Um, uh, we should probably, could maybe one more and then we can move on? One more, and then uh, just so everybody knows, I will keep your Q and A in the, um, if I haven't, if we haven't answered it, so we can come back to it maybe at the end or at a later point, we're gonna have two more breaks. So one more question. Why have giants pretty much diminished in today's day and age? Why have what pretty much diminished? Giants. Giants. Um, it's not, I mean, there were times when human beings were fairly tall, like six feet was relatively normal for some of our ancestors. Some of it has to do with nutrition. Um, we actually don't eat as well uh, as our ancestors until the last, maybe the last 50 years. But maybe you can explain more what you mean um, in the Q&A after, um, after the, uh, the full talk. So let's, so I'd like to, uh, to move on to the next part of the talk. Um, and that is um, some of the genes and connections that are different. So what's one thing that we do that you've never heard your pet dog do? Well, we're having a conversation with words and speech. Uh, and why can we do this? Whereas it seems that our close cousins, the chimpanzees cannot. Um, and one of the main differences is the extension of a long group of axons or connections between, you can think of these like the information superhighways of the brain. So there's about 20 of these really long distance, thick connections. You can think of them like, you know, the internet cables, <laughs> fiber optic cables or whatever you want. But these are the, the connections that take information from one part of the brain to another part that's maybe, you know, 10 or 20 centimeters away. And um, or 10 or 15 centimeters away. And one of the um, big differences between human beings and chimps is this area, this tract here um, that we technically call the arcuate fasciculus, but you don't need to remember that for the exam. Um, so this carries information from our Broca's area, which is critical for producing speech or Wernicke's area, which is critical for interpreting the speech we hear. And this, real, this rapid connection gives us real-time feedback on what we're saying. So I can hear myself speak, and if I'm not quite making the sound I thought I was going to make, I can correct it within a fraction of a second, so you hardly notice it. Um, that's an important thing for learning speech, because you have to be able to hear yourself talk. And chimpanzees basically can't do that because they don't have very much feedback. They certainly don't have the uh, rich, rapid feedback between these areas that we have. And a monkey has no, no hope of doing that. So that's one kind of new connection that's certainly important for the, one of the most obviously human distinct characteristics. But here's another one. And I, I, met, I told you that I would say more about the um, these expanded areas uh, that remember have to do with human relationships, especially close relationships. Um, so not only are the areas expanded, but their connections, their outputs to the rest of the brain are also greatly expanded so that this area has become uh, a hub for the human brain. And um, I'm just gonna point out a couple of places that connects to, so it connects forward to these areas of your cortex that are involved in making uh, quick judgments and, um, you know, responding to things that are pleasant or meaningful or important to you. But they also extend, and this is almost entirely unique to human beings, they extend um, laterally and to the back in, and to the side into areas that are associated with uh, regulating emotion and also areas that are uh, important for memory and even recognizing what something is. And so that's 
in part gives you the possibility of learning something like language, that social cues, your interactions with other people can influence how you understand uh, what you're seeing and um, uh, what, what uh, you're hearing. I want to also point out that um, there are several new kinds of cells that are greatly expanded in human beings, and one of them is a so-called spindle cell. And um, this picture makes them both sort of look kind of uh, a little bit like runts, not very uh, attractive, but actually the spindle cell um, uh, is, has a very, very thick axon, a very, very thick wire, if you will, that connects it to other cells. So this is what gets information from one area of the brain to another area very, very quickly. And by very, very quickly, I mean a few thousandths of a second. Um, so you can have a whole conversation back and forth in your head, uh, several, you know, uh, 10 or 20 times per second. And, um, and these spindle cells are particularly important for that. And the interesting thing is, again, they mostly run from these areas that I've been mentioning as sort of involved in social relationships and greatly expanded in human beings. Um, they mostly run from those areas to the whole rest of your brain. So you're, all the rest of your brain has information about you know, the social meaning of things in real time. OK, so those are some important changes in connections. I also should mention that uh, there are some other animals that have lots of these kind of spindle cells. And you've uh, probably heard that they're quite intelligent. Animals like dolphins and elephants have very high number of these kinds of cells. Now, um, I'd like to take another topic very quickly, and that is um, changes to our genes that made some of these things possible. And this, we're still sorting this out. In fact, uh, one of these pictures is from a paper that appeared in Science Magazine last week. Uh, that's this picture at the top right here. Um, and um, I'm just going to mention there's, there's several genes that are involved in, in making our brains bigger. This is very technical, so if you don't like, you know, don't like molecular biology, feel free to, to get up and get a drink. Um, but um, there's two important changes that seem to have made the most difference to our bigger brains, and they both have something very unusual in common. So, um, one of those genes is um, a, a, a duplication of a gene that monkeys and apes have, which I won't even try to pronounce for you. Uh, but this is a, for those of you who really like molecular biology, this is a rho GTPase associated protein, 11. Okay, so now you can forget that for the rest of the talk. Um, and um, this is a, what we have, we have an extra copy of this gene, but that copy is broken. And what that broken copy does is it interferes with the function of the original gene. So it slows it down. Okay, just as, so what does the original gene do? Well, it's, it puts the brakes on neuron proliferation. So the brakes are released or a, 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 they're a little looser in human beings than in apes. So our neuron progenitors, our stem cells for neurons, go on proliferating a bit longer. And that makes us have thicker cortices. And so how do we know that it's this gene? Well, um, oops, sorry, this. So what they've done is they've put um, that gene into a marmoset and uh, watched its brain grow. So here's a, uh, on the same scale, is a, the thickness of the cortex from the bottom to the top of a normal marmoset. And here is from the bottom to the top of a, um, of a marmoset with that one human gene introduced. Uh, and that gene basically interferes with the marmoset version of the, um, of the gene, which is very similar. And that release sort of loosens the brakes. The brakes don't get, a, get, get applied more gently. So uh, you get more of these cells being born and they fill out more of a cortex. So in fact, this brain is about 70% bigger than the normal marmoset brain. So that accounts for some of the fact that our brain is substantially bigger. Whoops. Um, 
We also have another group of duplications among a group of genes called NBPF, and that just stands for neuroblastoma, uh, I think, breakpoint uh, family. And as the name suggests, they're associated with a particular kind of cancer. And I bring this up so that they're also important for, um, for human brain expansion. And I bring this up because gene duplications are a kind of crude strategy. Most of evolution proceeds by sort of slow modifications of existing regulatory sites and existing genes. Um, gene duplications generally don't survive um, because they have damaging side effects. And um, the interesting thing is that these duplications, and there's actually more, have survived in human beings, which indicates that the benefits of having a large brain were certainly worth the side effects. And the side effects are, among other things, these, these neuroblastomas, and there's other kinds of damage that we have to our brain cells that, that uh, we think is due to this, um, the action of this gene. So, um, so that's one, you know, that's the general strategy seems very unusual that, um, and so something very important must have been driving the, the rapid expansion of the human brain. Now, another gene that you've probably heard of is a gene called Fox P2 or F-box uh, protein P2. Um, and that's a, um, a sort of master regulator of other genes. So it's, it, by its action, it turns on and off um, several dozen other genes. Um, and at the bottom here, I have a sort of a schematic uh, from the people who did the work um, and published it in Nature uh, about 18 years ago showing the differences between the different versions of the same gene in different species. So um, basically this is a gene that has had almost no substantive changes for a hundred million years. And then suddenly, meaning in the last seven million years, it's had two important changes just in the human lineage. And um, that seems rather unusual. Uh, and it turns out that that gene controls the genes that are expressed in circuits that control not only um, our speech, but also our fine movements of our hands. And so speech itself requires some very fine movements. We don't know at, the, at this point what difference that actually makes, except we know that people who have a mutation in FOXP2 almost always have trouble speaking. Interestingly, Neanderthals had our changed version of FOXP2, so it's possible they could, be, they could have had language. We don't know. So I've talked about two sort of big kinds of changes, but the majority of the changes have been sort of the typical kinds of evolutionary changes, very, relatively subtle, relatively slow, and lots of them. Um, and in particular, although you often hear that we're 98.5% chimpanzee, that's based on our, our proteins, but the, the DNA uh, has had, has, the proteins are only a small part of DNA, and, and most of what's changed is the regulatory switches that turn on and off the proteins. So um, we've had lots of changes in these regulatory switches. Um, it's been you know, slow in the sense that it's happened over six or seven million years, but relative to the changes in these switches in, let's say, rodents or in other branches of primates, we've had lots more changes. So there have been lots of genes that have been turned up or turned down, or more commonly, have been, uh, the, the control logic has changed. They are evoked in different circumstances. And we will talk about just a few of those um, a little later. So let me pause for a bit, a few more questions, and um, Krista, I'll let you um, take over sure. again. Sure. Um, what evidence, if any, do we have that lends itself to the hypothesis that our brains grew because of social nature? Um, okay, that's a good question. Always challenge a scientist when he says something dogmatic. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, so that is a, there are still 
There's still a lot of debate about that. I would say the majority of scientists think that uh, the evidence about how hard monkeys work to keep track of social relationships is, um, is, is uh, sorry, you, you, you didn't ask about brain size. You asked about um, for, for dominance. You know, I will say a little bit more about that um, in the, the next two parts of the talk, but very briefly, it's that we can build up culture. We can learn from not only the mistakes of our ancestors, but their, you know, what they did right. Um, and it's a slow process of accumulation, but in the last hundred years, it's really accelerated. But we have been able to sort of, you know, you and I could not invent modern computers by ourselves. But it's the, you know, it's the, the building on what other people have done. So we'll get to that in, in just a few minutes. Person? What, where was the Sing Anthropoid, anthropoid found? Synthanthropus, you mean? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's actually quite a ways back. I won't go back that far. Um, so that's, um, gosh, that's an older term. I believe that uh, someone will have, you know, I forget. That is, that is now a different species of, of hominin, and I, I can't remember which one. Someone can probably look it up, Google it, and find it. Um, but yes, that's one of the different, um, I'm not sure if Synthanthropus was a homo species or an um, uh, uh, Aust Australopithecus, uh, but um, yeah, someone can look it up, and I, but I don't remember. But, but they're, you know, several, they're, they're more than a million years back. They're quite a bit further back. Um, so next question, I think I had read or heard that human brain development took a big step forward when humans started eating cooked animal flesh. Is this true? Great comment. <laughs> Great question. Sure. So, um, again, there's quite a bit of, of debate about that. Uh, but I think the evidence is now coming in fairly strongly to the cooking hypothesis. So remember, I, I, I um, you know, said that the human brain size is really taking off about a million and a half years ago. So the oldest fires we have evidence of are, are you know, less than a million years old. So you know, that's as, much, as far back as we can place fires and cooking. But of course, people didn't necessarily you know, try to leave you know, monuments to their hearth fires that would last two million years. So it's very likely that, that cooking was going on sometime before that. And there's some indirect evidence um, having to do with carbon isotope ratios, which I won't go into here, but if, you, you know, if, if, we take a, if we take a course, you know, I can go into all that, um, that suggests that human beings were eating a lot of cooked meat, particularly, as well as some cooked vegetables, uh, perhaps a million and a half years ago. Uh, so Richard Rangham at Harvard has written a very nice book on this, uh, which I highly recommend. One more question and then we should move on. Sure. Um, are there any other competing hypotheses other than social and tool use? Sure. So I guess you might say the second place hypothesis right now is um, foraging complexity, or the environment complexity and foraging. So if you have to remember where foods of different types are at different times of the year. So chimps, for example, love figs, but figs are only going to be in season a few weeks a year. And, or a particular, I should say, a particular fig tree is only going to be in season a few weeks a year uh, making figs. So they have to remember when each fig tree in their, you know, uh, 20 square mile territory uh, actually is coming into season. So that's a complex foraging problem. Um, and so, you know, we would argue, well, human beings are omnivores, so they're, they're having to keep track of where, you know, the, the, the deer are, they have to keep track of where the roots are, they have to keep track of, of where water is, um, and they're doing this as they're moving around the landscape, so that's a complex foraging problem as well. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's more complex than the problem chimps have to solve, 
but you know, how would you measure that? How, how, I don't know. Um, there's also some indirect evidence, um, you know, and I'm running over time on this question, but there's some indirect evidence from other species that social complexity precedes foraging skill. So um, that, that's much lot, there, there's much more to answer on that. But let's, um, let's go on to the, the third part of the talk, the third quarter. And I wanna talk now about, um, and I'm gonna get back to the question that was asked earlier, about why we are so impressionable and why we learn so readily from each other, both good things and bad things. And I'm gonna start with something a little indirect. Okay, so and that is, remember that we got our start um, by walking on two legs quite early and uh, only got particularly smart much later. Um, and there's various reasons why we think human beings started walking upright. But we think Lucy, for example, could walk upright, although she was still pretty much at home in the trees and could, um, it wasn't, probably could not run very fast. Okay, so what are the consequences that, of that? Well, uh, one of the consequences that uh, probably uh, half of you on the call um, may ex you know, either have or may experience is that um, it's much harder for a human woman to give birth than for a chimpanzee female. Um, you, you may have wondered why chimpanzee females you know, manage to regularly give birth without having to have uh, midwives or go to the hospital or doctor's appointments or anything like that. Well, here's a good part of the reason, not the whole reason, but a good part of it. And that is that uh, here's on the right is a chimpanzee pelvis. You can see there's a lot of space for a birth canal. And on the right is a modern human pelvis, sorry, on the left, a modern human pelvis. And then we can see that even Lucy had the same kind of pelvis, or a very similar kind of pelvis, much flatter pelvis. Why do we have that? Well, because it, it helps us walk upright. Chimps can walk upright for maybe, and not really upright, but they can walk on two legs for maybe a hundred yards. And that's quite an accomplishment. All right, so to get back to one of the questions that was asked, it sure does make a difference. Um, and um, so we, you know, it's much harder to fit a, an infant's head through the birth canal. And so like, all problems that are desperate. Um, there's there's got to be some evolutionary solution, but again, it's a workaround. It's not, you know, it's not the way we would design it if we were designing human beings, but it's 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 a way to do it. And that is, well, we just have birth much at a much earlier stage. So this means that human infants are born at a less developed state than chimpanzee infants. And, and very roughly, you know, there, there's lots of different time scales, but very roughly, um, a human infant at the age of nine months is about as physiological, physiologically mature as a chimp newborn, you know, after just a few days. Um, and of course, if you watch monkey babies or chimpanzee babies, they're learning to crawl in a matter of a few weeks or months, uh, and they're, um, the cognitive tests show that they also um, outperform human babies cognitively for the entire first year of life. So, okay, so we're doing this so that um, our, our, we're sort of born, all human beings are born in some sense a bit prematurely, and our heads are only a quarter of the full size, um, whereas a chimp, um, a chimp infant's head is almost half their full size. So uh, we're getting born at roughly the same size of brain, but ours is gonna get, get swollen about twice as much. Okay, so some of the consequences of that are really important. So remember this happened first. This happened because we walked upright, which happened starting about four million years ago. But the brain did not get bigger until about a million and a half years ago. Okay, so as a consequence, because our brains are born at such an immature state, our circuitry, the wiring inside our brains, remains more flexible, more plastic is the technical term, but uh, we do much more rewiring of our brains 
during the first 10 years of our life than let's say a chimpanzee baby does. Uh, in fact, a chimp baby gets the, the, large, the most synapses of its entire life. Remember the synapses are the connections, so that's where the information is in the brain, the connections between the neurons. And a chimp baby has you know, achieved maximum connections at about one year of age. A human being gets maximum connections at seven years of age. And then they die back. Uh, so if you're, you know, if you're over seven, I'm sorry, it's all downhill from here. But um, you know, that's why your seven-year-old niece or nephew can tell you the names and habitats of 100 dinosaurs or maybe 100 Pokemon characters. Uh, whereas you, you, know, you would be hard pressed, you'd have to study to learn 20, okay? So we have lots of, of um, uh, lots more plasticity in our, in our brain structure. And there turn out to be several entirely independent mutations that uh, all act together to delay synapse maturity. And again, most of these are these sort of destructive mutations. They, they, are, they, they break a gene or they do something that, that sort of breaks its normal function. These are not evidence of, of you know, sort of slow, steady uh, selective pressure. This is evidence of something really, um, really, really sharp selective pressure for some period. So we, um, you know, we end up with many more synapses or connections between our brain cells than, do, than the apes or monkeys do. Okay, now um, maybe I'll just, I'll skip this and um, then talk a little bit about what does that plasticity give us? Or what are some of the changes that, that we have? And I, I want to draw the connection between this, uh, the changes in our brain and our sort of unique advantage in cooperation and cumulative culture. So one of the things that I think um, you've probably heard of if you've been reading neuroscience is a phenomenon called mirror neurons, or I like to call it mirror functionality. Is, is they're not a special type of neuron, but they're, uh, it, it's been found that if you re record from a monkey's brain or a human brain, you can often find cells that, uh, res that are active, that fire a lot, when, let's say, the monkey does something or when that monkey watches another monkey or a human being doing, you know, a very similar thing. So here the monkey's picking up, uh, it looks like a rock. I'm actually not sure what it is. Uh, and then watching the human being. And these are, um, these are records of the firing of that neuron. So you, if you go along one uh, trace here like this, every little spike here, every little dash, vertical dash, is representing a time when that neuron that's being recorded was firing. And you can see, you know, this, so it's firing maybe 20 or 30 times in one second, mostly in the first half second, as the monkey's reaching out. But it will also fire as he's watching, the monkey's watching this man reach out for the, uh, for the stone. And so uh, we can see, you know, again, a very specific, it's hardly firing at all before, but it seems to be very, um, very engaged by either doing or watching someone else do a particular action. And we think that that's very important for um, learning actions. Uh, and um, so most of these neurons that have these properties are in the sensory or motor parts of the brain. Um, but the, the important thing is that human beings have a lot more of this mirror response, uh, or at least more of their neurons have this kind of mirror response than neurons recorded from monkeys. So you basically see this response in the motor cortex and some uh, of the monkey, and not very, where, very many other places, but in human beings you see it uh, in the dorsolateral cortex, uh, so areas that are involved in what we would call thinking and making choices, uh, as well as in the motor areas and some of the areas um, uh, further back in the brain. 
So we think that those kinds of properties of our cells, uh, which have to do with plasticity in early life, um, are important for the compulsive imitation. So here, this is a sort of meant to be a humorous picture, but you know, this, this little boy is so earnestly trying to be like, uh, presumably his father and a friend or a father and an uncle. Um, so that's a, we, we say monkey see, monkey do, but in fact, human beings are much more compulsive imitators than, uh, than monkeys or apes. So apes will, you know, will watch you do something and then they'll try to do something with themselves, but they don't, you, if you watch them, you see that they don't have the right rhythm. So if you, you know, if you, uh, you pick up a saw, one of the, the favorite uh, activities in some of the Indonesian sanctuaries for orangutans is to have them saw wood, I don't know why. Um, and so if, you know, if they'll watch someone saw and they'll pick up the saw, they know they have to hit the, <laughs> the wood with it and move it, but they never seem to actually get it. Uh, they don't seem to, to be able to make it bite and, and stay in the same position. But human children will pick that up fairly quickly. And part of it is sort of picking up the rhythm and the, the way of approaching something, as well as getting the idea uh, of, of doing the action. But human beings take this to an extreme when they're trying to solve problems, when they're learning to do a new thing. And I'm gonna just pause this for, um, so I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna pause. And then I'm going to get uh, I'm going to get you show you a video, and now I'll start sharing again. Again, um, and here we are. So um, so here, this uh, experimenter in the the black uh, shirt is showing this little boy in the green turtleneck, not turtleneck, green uh, vest how to do, um, how to open the box to get a treat. So there's a, a candy bar inside and the experimenter is showing him how to do it. Now watch what he does. Can you all hear that? So he's showing him how to get the treat. Now he leaves the room. Notice that the, the child is doing everything exactly the same way, or at least trying to imitate every action that the adult did. So, <laughs> so the, um, the child does everything that the, the adult does. And um, let's uh, get the, uh, here we are. So, whereas if you, if you show that same, whoops, let's try this again. So if you show that, if you do exactly the same thing with a chimpanzee, they figure out very quickly that it's only the last step that matters. They don't have to go through all the mumbo jumbo. But a large fraction of human children will learn how to do all of the mumbo jumbo first. So, so that sort of ability to learn from others is one important um, ability, uh, but another is our ability to cooperate. And um, what's really striking is how much we cooperate both to solve problems, but also, you know, when we're working on sort of the same kind of task in parallel, we will learn from each other how to do it better. And a number of studies with both chimpanzees and <clears throat> monkeys have shown that they don't really pick up from other, other animals very quickly. And they don't cooperate. So these boys here have been uh, hunting. They, have, they caught a bird that they're serving up and they are, uh, that kind of cooperation is really the key to, um, to human activity. So I'm gonna pause here and um, take questions uh, for, just take a couple of questions and then we should probably move on and do the last little part of the talk. Sure, I'm gonna questions? combine 
two questions from Joel and John because they're fairly similar. Um, humans have 23 chromosomes, why other apes have 24. Was one chromosome lost or did two chromosomes fuse somehow? Yes. So our chromosome two is a fusion of an ape, two of the apes chromosomes. Um, and I can't remember which numbers, but two of the smaller apes chromosomes fuse to give us our one large chromosome two. So apes do not have a single, you know, their, our chromosome three is their chromosome two. And they have uh, several smaller chromosomes that fuse to make our chromosome two. Um, uh, so we have this sort of more or less the same total amount of DNA, okay? Is it true that mimicking a smile actually does release serotonin and makes you happy? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, can I plead uh, that it's beyond my expertise? <laughs> that is such a, that would take us pretty far afield. There has been some, some studies showing that it seems to have a small effect and some studies showing no effect. And yeah, I, I, I don't know. I suppose it really matters what context you do it in. They, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's not a big effect um, if it's there, but, uh, but we don't know. What is the function of glial cells? I'm not saying that right, sorry. Glial. Cells, and why are there proportionally so many? Sure, good question. So, um, Remember, I introduced them as, as the stage hands. You know, if you think of the neurons as the actors, they're you know sort of doing the stuff that 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 we have our our focus is on. The glial cells are sort of the stage hands. They're you know making things work behind the scenes. They're helping the actors change clothes, all of those kinds of things. Um, and one of the other kinds of changes from, let's say, mammals generally to primates to human beings is an increase in the number of glial cells. So what we've done is in some sense offloaded a lot of neuron functions onto glial cells. And you know, we might think that maybe the neurons have become more streamlined or more efficient at their job. That's just speculation. Um, but it's generally true that um, a lot of the functions that um, uh, but let, let, me, let me start again. So, for example, rats actually have bigger neurons than we do. Um, and they have very few glial cells. So their neurons are, in some sense, doing more of the work. Whereas our neurons are very much like thoroughbred horses. They depend for, they, they, they can't even feed themselves. They basically depend on the astrocytes, which is one type of glial cell, to spoon feed them. Um, so, anyway, for whatever metaphor, take that for what it's worth, okay? Um, maybe I should go on to the last part of the talk and then we can have a good 15 minutes of quick Q&A at the end. Sure, sounds good. We have about 30 questions, so just keep that in mind. Okay, I'll try to, I'll try to be quick. So I want to talk about uh, attention and sustained effort. So one of the really distinct things about human beings is what's shown in these two pictures, that we can concentrate for some length of time on something that's not immediately rewarding or stimulating. And we do it best with other people and we can share, we can look at the same thing. Like this little girl is looking at what her mother's showing her and um, able to focus jointly on that. Um, if you try to do that with a chimp or a monkey, they just don't get it. Um, you can try to indicate, you know, let's look at this together. No, they, they're not gonna play. Um, they, by and large, you know, they, they don't have the idea that you might share an intention with them. They see you as a competitor, you know, they see other apes as largely competitors. They, they, they're very reluctant to make really trusting uh, friendships and relationships. Whereas that's critical for, you know, for this child learning from the mother or also for these young adults, um, you know, trying to work together to figure something out. Now, one of the big changes, and this is um, one that I'm, I guess I'm particularly interested in because I was on this paper, um, is that human beings gener have, generate a lot more dopamine 
in some of these higher order cortical areas uh, that I've mentioned, some of the, uh, so we call them association areas where many different inputs are coming together and decisions are being made and choice, you know, dis distinctions are being made. Um, we have a lot more um, uh, dopamine synthesis um, uh, relative to apes. And um, so human beings show less modulation, sorry, I want, sorry, my apologies. I, I thought I had taken this slide out and replaced it with the next slide, my apologies. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna start again. Um, so, you know, one of the important things about human behavior is that we're capable of sustained effort. And um, that effort seems to depend on a neurochemical called dopamine. Um, and that enables, you know, we just, you know, that enables, you know, these poor guys to, to, you know, do the backbreaking labor day after day, and it enables you to slog at your, at your coursework or to, you know, put in nine to five at the office doing, you know, things you may or may not like. And um, one of the key differences is that human beings have a lot more dopamine uh, in areas to do with memory, emotion, and association, as I mentioned. Uh, than monkeys or apes. So this is a graph from our paper and <clears throat> uh, the human levels of the dopamine synthesis uh, are in uh, red, the chimpanzee levels are in blue, and the monkey levels are in green. And you can see that especially in areas like the amygdala, um, the striatum, which is where we have a sort of quick uh, habits, um, and um, sorry that part of this got chopped off the hippocampus, we have a lot more. Uh, so we're able to sort of motivate ourselves both to do work and to put in hard work thinking, which other apes have a harder time doing. And part, now that also has a downside. Um, so I'm just gonna say that one of the, the, the odd things about human brains is that we actually consume about twice as much energy as ape brains. So our, our brains, our three pound brains, draw about 20% um, of, our, of our total oxygen use and, and energy use. Um, but that's about twice as much as an ape brain does. And um, if, you, if you look at what's happening in a human brain when someone's not you know, necessarily engaged fully in something, which is, you know, face it most of the time, um, it turns out that the social brain regions that I mentioned, this, this picture may be hard to figure out, but this is looking at sort of the inside view of one half of the cortex, and this is looking at the outside view of one half of the cortex. So this is like a midline view. Um, and these orange areas are these areas that are active in this um, so-called default mode, which is basically what your brain, where your brain is burning energy when you are just you know, not engaged with what's around you. You're you're sort of ruminating or thinking on your own, and so we have a lot more internal dialogue than apes do, as far as we can tell, or internal activity, and that has a real dark side. So when people are obsessive, or when they're depressed uh, or psychotic, there'll be a lot more of this internal dialogue, and it turns out they are also. Um, generating a lot more dopamine. So there's a much higher level of dopamine in their brains. So again, this is something that's given us a tremendous advantage as a species, but comes with significant uh, drawbacks and significant problems. So I'd like to, to wrap up with some, some perspective and, and some prospects. So I often get asked if our brains are still evolving. Well, you know, <laughs> What time scale are we talking about here? So, you know, we might say arbitrarily that let's say still evolving means the last 100,000 years, okay? So, which is a long, you know, that's a long time by our historical standards, but that's, you know, that's only 3,000 generations. That's not much by evolutionary standards. And so, yeah, there have been changes. Uh, some of them are not very complementary. So our brains are actually about 10% smaller than our ancestors of 50,000 BC. Um, and we've also had some variants like uh, you've heard of the Alzheimer's disease gene APOE4. So the APOE4 
Uh, four is actually the ancestral form that we share with chimps and, and uh, monkeys. But um, the, Apo the ApoE2 and 3, the other variants uh, that protect against Alzheimer's seem to have originated and spread in the last, sometime in the last 80,000 years, perhaps. So again, you ask why? Why would we, you know, something that's been stayed stable so long change in the last 100,000 years? Well, we think that that's when grandparents became important. There's also maybe a change in diet. So this, this is not, you know, consensus, but this is the most, um, the most common idea right now. So this is sort of a time scale that's, you know, relevant for evolutionary time, but that's much longer than we most like to think. What about the last 10,000 years um, or 20,000 years? Um, well, there is some, again, very indirect evidence and weak evidence. Um, it suggests that we are getting some um, <clears throat> changes, again, in those regulatory sites. Um, one of the interesting things in my, my research is that there's a, a key scaffolding protein that holds all of your uh, sort of uh, inhibitory receptors, the ones that sort of calm you down uh, in place, it holds them in place, and there seem to be different variants being selected in East Asia versus use, uh, Europe. So there's, there's evidence of recent evolution, even in behaviorally relevant genes. So we might ask, okay, will we evolve, will our brains evolve in the future? I mean, of course, if you'd asked someone 50,000 years ago, they would have said, of course, we're the pinnacle of evolution, if they knew about evolution. Um, so we always like to think that we're, you know, the latest, the last word, but we're just the most recent word, uh, if that. And um, it seems that human genome has evolved much more rapidly in the past 10,000 years than in the previous, any previous 10,000 year period. Um, and we are also getting to the point where we could actually influence our own evolution. We could engineer uh, some human genes. Uh, and you know, some people are talking about, should we engineer genes that will actually change how we behave? Um, I'm leaving that as a question. That's much more than we can do in, in, in 30 seconds. I'd like just to leave you with a little bit of uh, further reading. If, you've, uh, in, if you're interested in some of these topics and you'd like some reading, I recommend these four books at present. I keep updating this you know, every time. Um, this is beautifully written. This really focuses on, um, although it's a little out of date, this central book, the Evolution of Childhood, really focuses on the, so, the social experience. And there's another good book um, by Sarah Blaffer Hurdy uh, with a very similar theme, um, Mothers and Others. Uh, and then this is a very recent book uh, that sort of looks at the whole of the evolution of the brain, not just from seven million years ago, splitting with chimps, but you know from the beginning. And then there's uh, another book that um, I didn't get a cover for uh, about uh, cooperation and human evolution and success. So with that, I'm going to thank you for your attention. Glad you, you stayed with me. And I'll, the rest of the time is questions and answer and discussion. So I will open it up and start reading some questions. Um, did the development of a more sophisticated linguistic skills correspond to this 1.5 million inflection point? Um, we don't know is the short answer. <laughs> um, we think that the linguistic skills probably coincided with the changes to that gene FOXP2 I showed you, but we don't know when those changes occurred, except, well, let's, let's put it this way. We do know they occurred prior to half a million years ago, uh, but we don't know if they occurred, you know, 600,000 years ago or a million years ago or 2 million years ago. And that would be what we would really like to know. So a million and a half is as good a guess as any we have right now. Okay, um, a question from John, is it lettuce? Would it be the same in the planet kingdom molecular, molecularly? Oh boy, my tongue is tied, sorry. 
is what the same in the plant kingdom? Um, it's in the lettuce. It's in I'm, the lettuce. Yeah. I understand it. I'm sorry. What? I'm not sure I understand that either. And maybe John can send me another chat or put something in the chat so we can clarify that question. Yeah, let's come um, back to that. Um, I, sure. I, I don't Here's understand. another question. It's no. Is it known whether the connection between Bracas and Warnicke's area areas is responsible for our quote internal voice? Uh, uh, <laughs> that is a good question, and I don't know the answer, and I have never heard anybody or read anybody uh, give any plausible argument for that. Um, I'm inclined to believe that because speech is so important to us, we are more likely to imagine aspects of hearing voices. Um, and there are people for whom that's so vivid that it sounds like an external voice. Um, so I'm guessing that it probably does, but I, I don't know. I mean, we'd have, you know, there's no way to do the experiment of, chopping out somebody's, uh, well, I guess there probably are some people with damage just to that area, but I don't know what their, what their, what their results are. It's a good question, but we don't know the answer. Sure. Um, next question, follow up to my original question, spindle cells could be <laughs> some evidence for this. Any others? I can't remember what Amber's original question was. I have to go back and look. You want to go back and look and, and see? Can... Um, that'll take me a moment. So we'll come back to that. Um, is the ARHGAP11 duplication unique to humans? Yes. Any idea how long ago the duplication event happened? Um, yes, it is unique to humans and uh, we have some idea that it's probably at least a million years old because uh, there's actually more than one duplicate. Uh, yeah. Um, so it's, it's a while back. Does the mention ARHGAP11 difference modify the structure of cortical layers as well as overall size? Another good question that I was just thinking about this afternoon and wished thinking, I bet somebody smart's gonna ask me that. And I don't know, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, there are more granule cells in the human brain than in, um, in the human cortex. So they're particularly found in layer four of human cortex uh, than in let's say an ape brain. Um, so that's very possible, but you know, they're, they're made relatively late, uh, so that's when this slowing down the brakes would probably have an impact, but, you know, until we have an experimental test, it's just speculation. So, good idea. Why don't you become a scientist and, and do a PhD thesis on that? It's a technology <laughs> here for now for doing that. Um, okay. I cannot take statin drugs because they scavenge the brain cholesterol and prevent natural thinking. The majority of people are not affected because the statins do not cross the blood brain barrier. Barrier, yeah. Is it true that brain cholesterol is needed for the synapses connections to occur? Uh, so, cholesterol is an important building block of all of lipid cell membranes. So, neurons just have a an awful lot of cell membrane, an awful lot of membrane real estate relative to their size uh, of, you know, um, cell real, you know, cell volume. So yeah, they need a lot of cholesterol. Um, yeah, you might have that checked out if, if, because those are things that shouldn't really, you know, you shouldn't have a lot of crossing of blood brain barrier. Uh, I mean, if, as you get older, you get more of that, but, but it's not something a middle-aged adult should have a lot of. Okay, did you find Amber's earlier question? I didn't. So Amber, if you can put it in the chat what your earlier question is. Um, but I, I can go on to another question because we have quite a few. We have like 40. Okay. <laughs> I don't mind staying a few minutes past eight, but, but I'll let that up to you. 
No, I'm good. I'm good. If people are enjoying the the conversation, so we have whole genome sequences of Neanderthals, Homo. Oh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. The, the Nisonova. That's okay. The Nisovans, sure. Yeah. Now, are these changes in regulatory sequences found in our closest relatives or just in modern humans? You know, uh, <laughs> again, another good question. Um, so when I did the comparison of the regulatory regions, uh, the Neanderthal and Denisovan se sequences were not available. So, um, and I don't have time to do it now, <laughs> but that would be a great question to, to, to answer. I think we could answer that now. Um, I, I've not seen anybody actually um, make that specific comparison, the sort of broadly, uh, a lot of the regulatory region changes, you know, affecting things like hair and skin color and body density. Those have, um, you know, those, many of those occur in Denisovans and in Neanderthals. So my but, guess is that a lot of the, the brain changes, the reg regulatory changes also occurred in Neanderthals, but which ones in particular, I don't know. Sorry, I did get Amber to respond. Her first question was, what evidence, if any, do we have that lends itself to the hypothesis that our brains grew because of social nature? And then her question, follow-up question was, spindle cells could be some evidence for this. Any others? Thank you, sure. Okay, now I get it. Now I get it. Sure. And yes, spindle cells, I think, are some additional evidence. And, and that's why I put them in there a um, few slides after the brain ex uh, expansion, because I think they are. They're suggesting that the, you know, there, there seem to be a variety of different evolutionary selective pressures sculpting different aspects of this social brain system. And that suggests, you know, convergently that they, that that's, was one of the major foci of evolutionary pressure. Um, you know, the others being that, um, you know, the, the uh, sort of, not only the spindle cells, but also the arc, the um, uncinate fasciculus, that, that, you know, a very thick layer that is, is very much thinner in apes. Um, that goes back uh, into the regulation of the emotional and, and sort of social recognition areas of the brain. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's a lot more to say about that, but that would, you know, you'd have to take a course. <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, quite a bit. So I got a, a kind of a long question in the G chat, and I do apologize. We can't get to everyone's questions, and I really appreciate the questions and Mark does his best to answer off the top of his head as much as possible. Um, hopefully we can continue these conversations to go more in depth. But um, the question that I got on the chat was, um, what does brain dead mean? What happens to the brain as the body dies? Why <laughs> is it that some people cannot tell the right from their left? So there's kind of two different several questions in there yeah yeah so if you could kind of so yeah. there's a lot of argument over what really brain dead should mean and how it should be defined we we usually think of it as uh either the cells are are dead or the uh you know the 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 cells have basically lost all their electrical activity and the cells some of the cells may still be alive and if it actually a recent experiment by one of my uh, colleagues, uh, Nena Chestan at Yale, showed that you could actually uh, revive some cells of a pig's brain after it had been dead eight hours. Um, so, you know, it takes a, it takes a while to die. And um, I don't know if, if we ever get to if I ever do the talk on the biology of religion, I'll talk about the near death experiences and the you know, what have brain recordings of animals having those near-death experiences. Um, Kristen, you want to mention, uh, several, pe several people have asked questions that are very technical. You want to mention the, the uh, seminar series? Yes. Um, Mark is going to do a three-part series um, as a part of our further reflection instruction-led courses and it's a further exploration of the topic we address today on brain evolution and he has um, three different areas that he will address the registration
is up on the AHA Center for Education um, website. I can put that in the chat if people are not familiar. Um, you can register. There's a small fee. It will start August 25th. Am I correct on that yep. date? August 25th. Um, so if you're interested, please register. We've already done one course with Mark and it's been, it was a great experience. Um, I thought I was going to tune out and I ended up being really engaged. So I think the next um, more in-depth discussion on brain evolution and the three-part series will be really interesting for those of you who want a little bit more meat to the topic. So um, I, I'll put that in the chat now. Great, thanks, Kristen. Yeah, yeah I'd be happy. So I'll be, that, I'll be talking a lot more about the specific genes the, and the you know, specific cell types. And you'll be reading some scientific articles or at least some good summaries of scientific articles. But you know, we'll, we'll talk through it and, and look at, you know, it'll cover a lot of the same material, but in, very, in a lot more depth. Um, and you'll get to argue with me and ask questions. So let's have uh, maybe 10 or 12 minutes more of questions and then uh, we'll wrap it up. How's that? Sure. Um, next question, uh, has the brain in general developed more intelligently with the adaptation of modern technology? What parts of the brain do we use more now than before modern technology, such as computers? <laughs> well, two good questions. I, I wish I had time to give really good answers, but I'll give crude answers. So first, um, we don't think that brain structure has changed detectably at all in the last you know, several centuries. Um, probably your brain is working a little better than let's say your grandparents' brains just because you're better nourished. Um, there has been, uh, for most of the 20th century, a steady increase in uh, IQ scores. In fact, they had to basically recalibrate the IQ table every you know, 20 or 30 years. Um, and because people were getting better and better at, at these. And so we think that, you know, having experience with some of the, you know, more people were literate, more people were uh, using a variety of abstract communication methods, that that improved um, at least the abilities to do those kinds of tasks, even if without changing the brain structure. Now, one thing that's concerning is that the last 20 years, IQ scores have started to go down. Um, so maybe technology of some sort helps, especially, and my opinion is that sort of active technology helps where you're, you know, writing and doing things or mo moving your body. Um, whereas it seems the last 20 years, we've had more passive technology and that doesn't seem to, you know, doesn't seem to be helping at least insofar as correlation is causation, which of course, as you know, is just a guess. But um, something has been lowering IQ scores in the last 20 years. Um, let's take the next question. Sure. Um, if a person underwent a stroke and typing is broke, broke area was affected, does Wernicke area goes down with it too because of the thick, fast bridge connection between the two? I'm no, the, the cells don't, in one, if, if you have a stroke, that basically deprives the cells of oxygen in one area and they die. Now what happens is, well, okay, yes and no, how about that? <laughs> you, should always, you should always be a little suspicious of scientists who say yes and no, like final answers. But um, the, um, so it actually, one of my colleagues, uh, Dalit Peled, um, has shown that actually the areas that receive input from a dead area um, also suffer some loss of function. They don't do as well. They don't die, but they, you know, because they've lost some of the inputs that they were used to and counting on, they are, they're somewhat disturbed and they try to sort of make, make up for that. So uh, the Wernicke's area won't die, but it will it will have a little bit of a harder time, we think. But, but people with strokes in Broca's areas often can understand speech quite well. Next question. Sure. 
Um, has our ability to sweat over most of our body driven human evolution, not just biopedalism, per born to run or the Terra Huma A tribe, if I remember their tribal Terra name. Wamara, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so our ability to sweat has probably made it possible for us to run. It's not clear what direct effect that's had on the brain. Um, you know, we, we think of ourselves as maybe, I don't, if you're thinking really hard, you don't usually have a hot head. Uh, whereas if you're, you know, run, you know, you run for five minutes under the African sun and you really need to sweat. So Next. this is kind of this is kind of interesting. Please address the point of what comes first, chicken or the egg? Social structure precedes brain development. Brain develop precedes social structure functions. That's one of those psychology nature nurture angles. It is, <laughs> and and I'm you know, and it's I think the answer is sort of like the chicken and egg problem is well, there was a sort of chicken and a sort of <laughs> you know and an egg, and then there was a somewhat more like a chicken and and a more like a chicken egg. Um, that they sort of bootstrap. Um, and this, this is um, Joe Henrik in his book, The Secret of Our Success, goes into this in some detail. Um, and there's another good book whose name I'm forgetting right now. That, um, oh, um, Kevin uh, Lalonde's book, um, that sort of go into this sort of bootstrapping that, you know, as you, you know, as society changes and it becomes um, more cooperative, or more, you know, you get more done by be, being cooperative, then that exerts pressure, you know, that then people whose brains uh, predispose them to be more cooperative will have more children. And then they, um, you know, then you more people with brains that are more predisposed, you know, have those kinds of attributes will cooperate in different ways, you know, more, more richer and more extensive ways. So I think that there's lots of, of, uh, of uh, ways that, that the two ratchet each other up. But that's, you know, that's, that's a course in evolution. <laughs> okay, Kristen, uh, you're muted. Sorry, I just want to make sure that everybody knows about tomorrow's AHA virtual conference. You can still register. There's going to be lots of good conversation, good talks. And so I hope to see some of you there. Um, Thank you all for coming tonight. This has been great. And if Mark wants to take a couple more questions and people are interested and want to hang in there, I am totally there to read more questions. It's just been really fun to be a part of this. And we are definitely going to do more um, Critical Minds and some instructed further reflection courses. There's more stuff coming up. So look at our website, look at the AHA website, Check us out on social media. Um, that's my advertisement for now. <laughs> sure. So if you want more questions, I'm more than well, happy. To do that. I, I, I can stay for another, you know, maybe till, you know, for another 10 minutes or so, maybe eight till eight. That 10. sounds good. Okay. I'm going to stop my video, but I will continue to ask questions. Great. Um, Bonobos tend to walk upright, upright more like humans too. Are their birth canals closer to human than chimps? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, they, they may be slightly better at it than chimps are, um, but they, they can't maintain it for, for very long periods of time, and they can't run uh, on two legs for any period of time. Okay, how about next one? Yeah, I'm here. Um, what do, uh, no, we got the brain dead. I, we answered that. If human infants are less mature at birth, what would happen if birth was delayed? <laughs> well, let's, you know, <laughs> let's not talk to the mother about that. Um, that's a good question. So, uh, I mean, some of the superficial things would be that, you know, babies would be born with their skulls more fully formed, like chimp babies are born. But you know that human babies are born with this big soft spot because their their plates haven't grown together yet. Um, but um, I guess one of the things that would be different if we could manage to give birth uh, much later would be that um, 
at least with the genes we have now, that we would, um, our children's brains would be less plastic. They'd be more rigid, um, less, you know, malleable and less interested in, um, or at least less malleable uh, and, and plas you know, a changeable by experience. Um, okay, just a few comments. So I want to get to a question. Last week I saw a talk by Dr. Celia Hayes Oxford. Oh, yes. Very nice. That, mm -hmm, Very good. Who argued that a number of core human cognitive capabilities depend more on culture than some have originally asserted. For example, I think she's, uh, I think she's fully right about that. Yeah, yeah, I really love her work. Yeah, so I, I want to finish this question to make sure I do due diligence. So, for example, she argued that most of our ability to learn from imitation only arises due to particular childcare practices that are common in human cultures. Perhaps many neural mirroring responses arise during development. In the current community of evolutionary neuroscientists, how controversial the claims of Dr. Hayes. <laughs> okay, so I think I think Cecilia Hayes is is got a, a lot of good original ideas, but she is a little bit off the main street. I mean, I, and I think I happen to like a lot of, uh, and I think she's right about a lot of the things where she's bucking the consensus. But you know, uh, she is bucking the consensus, and <laughs> part of my responsibility is to say both what I think and also what the consensus, you know, what the majority think. So, um, so I want to, I, I, did you finish your question? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, I, I love taking this question because this is a person who I haven't heard from for years. He's a graduate of the Humanist Institute. Hello, Calvin Chatlos. What would you say that chimps engage in parallel play rather than cooperative play? Um, so a lot of their play is rough and tumble. So that's, that's not parallel, but it's not really cooperative either. Um, but they tend not to, they, they tend not to, let's say, do what human children will do where they'll um, play with an object together where they have rules. Like you can have a play with your dog where you throw a ball and the dog gets, you know, grab, goes, runs out, gets the ball and brings it back to you. And then you throw the ball again and you sort of, you know, you, you trade places with the ball, so to speak. But it's hard to play a game like that with a chimp. Uh, not because they can't, you know, because they're just really reluctant to, you know, pass something on. So you don't have chimps playing catch, for example. They are excellent pitchers and excellent catchers, but they, they never play catch um, because that requires a sort of cooperation. Um, you know, even some birds will play catch, um, but, they, but, but chimps don't. So, so those are the kinds of um, cooperative games that, that they could play, but they don't. And they don't, you know, so some chimps carry around little, all, little objects that look vaguely like something. And we think they're like, you know, like little kids with, with their pet animal or their doll, you know, with their, their, um, you know, their stuffed animal, their teddy bear or their doll. We don't know, of course, um, but it's sort of touching. But they never share those. They never play with an object pretending that it is something. Um, so those are two kinds of cooperative plays that we see in, in people that we don't see in chimps. We probably can take one more question and I just love having you all here. And again, I'm just going to repeat that we will do more of these. Um, and Mark has been, um, I pushed him into doing happy hours where we have more open discussion. So if you're interested in a happy hour from Mark, maybe I can, push him into doing another. Um, but uh, for sure, if you're, the further reflection will go more deep. And um, I think it's more discussion oriented because it's a instructor. Yeah, so that'll be a back and forth question. And yeah, discussion. yeah. So like, like, like the, the, like last, the history stuff. Yeah, so the last question is, do you think human mirroring contributes to superstition, i.e., we see too many patterns and mimic them and superstitiously make the wrong conclusion. You know, um, 
I think it's more likely that it's our, our overactive social brains, that we see intentions, we see people uh, behind things, uh, and we see purposes and intentions where purposes aren't. Um, so it's not clear to me that the mirror neurons by themselves, or at least the mirror function, um, they don't come with labels saying, you know, this is a mirror neuron and that one's not. Um, but the, mirror, the sort of mirror functionality of many neurons seems, um, you know, it, it's possible. I, I, just, I, I just don't know of any, any way to sort of tell whether it has an, an, an um, whether that is an important part of superstition or not. But I think we can say that the, the sort of social brain is an important part of superstition. So before we end, Mark, do you want to say a few more words or? Um... Sure. Um, actually, one thing that I, I meant to say right at the end is something that um, I think has a lot of bearing on our current sort of distress in, in America. And that is that one of the biggest mistakes that I think European and Western thinkers generally have made is assuming that you know, what's our essence? Our human essence is entirely our individual selves, what's in our skulls. And, uh, you know, in, in, in medieval Western Christian thought, that essence was the soul. Uh, for modern Western scientists, they think of it as the brain, but they think that, you know, that's what's special. It's something inside the skull. Whereas most, uh, or at least let's say many other cultures recognize that human beings are sort of embedded in social milieu, social relationships, which affect who they become and, and their development. And I think, the, I think that the important takeaway from this is that the key to human, let's say success or domination as a species is not that our individual brains are in some way superior to an ape's brain, but rather that we have evolved to sort of take so much from other people, to internalize other people's ways of thinking and feeling. And like most of human evolution, that has been in one hand a tremendous advantage, let's say in the Stone Age, but it can also be a liability. You know, as we look around to the modern media circus, maybe that same trait is perhaps also a liability. So that's, uh, that's where I'll end it. And um, I hope to see some of you on the, the course, uh, and maybe we, and Kristen and I will talk about maybe a, a, a return engagement for, for a larger public.